much. That's helpful. So th thank you very much, panel, for um, giving me the opportunity to come and uh, provide you with an update on the Growth Board. I'm sure many of you uh, know, know the background to the Growth Board, um, so I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions, but uh, forgive me if I'm uh, sort of giving you an up-to-date picture when, when some of you might not have had the history, but I will try and pick up on how we've got to today with the Growth Board. So as you'll know, and Councillor Cocking, obviously, through his declaration, um, reminded us the Growth Board is formed of all the 11 uh, council leaders in Hertfordshire, along with the chair of the Local Enterprise Partnership. And more recently, we've new co-opted members from Homes England and the independent chair of the Hertfordshire and West Essex Independent uh, Integrated Care System. So we are a body that's come together to take uh, that long term place leadership perspective for Hertfordshire. And this is the, the, the kind of the reason why we have the growth board, the purpose, the, these ambitions and vision were drawn together as part of the early work of the growth board in thinking about the common narrative, the reasons why and what we were looking to achieve as part of the growth board. So you can see there improving the life for everyone in Hertfordshire and making sure our, our communities are supported and that we grow Hertfordshire in a way that respects and honours the history, the great history of how it's grown and the character that keeps it special. But they're also making sure that we're securing support for our economy and the infrastructure, the right kind of infrastructure to support our sustainable growth as we go forward. So that's the purpose, the plan for growth in Hertfordshire that the Growth Board is working on. And the, the Growth Board was formed in 2018, really around that collaboration to try and tackle those issues that were greater than could be dealt with by individual authorities on their own. So you can see here um, that issues such as infrastructure, for example, are of a scale and affordability that requires us to work together, bid to government, secure infrastructure investment in Hertfordshire through a collaborative and joint working approach. And the key challenge that the Growth Board has been looking at over time since it was formed in 2018 are set out here, homes and communities, and I'll say a bit more about that later, but we, we know we have a range of issues around the delivery of homes, the affordability of homes in Hertfordshire. Uh, infrastructure is a key part of delivering good quality placemaking and making sure we get infrastructure of the right kind in the right place at the right time are key challenges and a key driver for the work of the Growth Board. The environment, including climate change and achieving net zero uh, and biodiversity net gain are massively important issues for Hertfordshire as part of growth and going forward. And we need to take that integrated approach that tries to make sure that we deliver good growth, but we address those climate change and carbon issues at the same time. Economy and jobs, vitally important to Hertfordshire. Um, Neil will cover an up-to-date uh, picture when he's doing his presentation on the LEP, but you'll know that we are a net contributor to UK PLC, generating revenue for the economy to help support levelling up elsewhere. Our key sectors are vitally important to have good quality jobs and skills and opportunities for our residents in Hertfordshire. So a key issue uh, that the LEP leads on, but the Growth Board supports through its place-based focus. Getting investment into Hertfordshire fundamental not just for jobs but for infrastructure and the quality of life that we enjoy and also positioning Hertfordshire with government making sure that we're, we're on the agenda that our ambition is understood these have been the key things that uh, the growth board has been working on over the last two to three years and our, our program focus for the last year has had three specific theme, themes that were agreed by uh, leaders and chief executives at, towards the end of last year. And as you can see here, Future Hertfordshire is looking long term, taking that long term strategic planning and place based perspective uh, through the joint strategic planning activities that are going on both in southwest Hertfordshire and northeast and central Hertfordshire. So two plans are proposed there at slightly different stages but they will help with what is a, a difficult challenge of producing local plans uh, for the 10 uh, district and borough areas, but also making sure that we can actually look out to 2050 and take that long-term perspective. So that's a key part of the work that's going on. 
obviously climate change and sustainability through that relationship with the Part for Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership is a golden thread that runs through growth. And it's something that the Growth Board has a key role at the implementation end of growth in making sure that we're taking forward those ambitions and looking to achieve our net zero uh, and carbon related um, targets. Town centre has been a key issue, particularly during COVID, and we need to be looking at what we can do to support the, the health and vitality uh, and protect our town centres going forward. Health as part of healthy placemaking uh, is an important issue. I've just mentioned that we've been uh, really pleased that the independent chair of the Hertfordshire ICS has joined us because that join up between making sure the places we design, deliver, support through the planning system are, are healthy, they promote active travel and mental health well-being, all the things that we can do at a placemaking level we are thinking about. Community wealth building, making sure that we are um, using the power of the Hertfordshire economy and the Hertfordshire purchasing and the way we deliver services to retain wealth, create wealth locally. And digital is a big thing for Hertfordshire. Uh, there's a, a Hertfordshire digital strategy that the Growth Board and the LEP and Hertfordshire County Council have been working on. And one of the proposals go through the Growth Board at its meeting on the 6th of January will be to work with the County Council to set up a team to take the digital work forward to help us progress our full, full fibre and digital connectivity to the level where it needs to be, uh, making sure our, our places are uh, digitally enabled to, to the, the extent that we can we can really push that. Uh, the, the middle theme, as you can see, is about being investment ready. So supporting our economic clusters, the LEP are leading in relation to skills and, and business support. But from a growth board perspective, there are place based uh, support activities that we need to be thinking about, both around Stevenage and the Gunnelswood area where the Selangene cluster is, is hosted, down in southwest Hertfordshire where the film, TV and media cluster is seeing huge investment in Broxbourne, Hartsmere. Uh, you know, we're really seeing globally significant levels of investment going there and we need to do, play our part to support that but also make sure that we get the benefits and we leverage the skills and other externalities for our communities from that development. So we want to make sure we're creating the right conditions for investment. People know that Hertfordshire is open for business and we're getting the right kind of business investment happening here. And then we want to make sure that Hertfordshire is delivery ready uh, we've identified the homes that we need for Hertfordshire over the next decade or so. We need to work together with our district and boroughs, with the local planning authorities to make sure that that delivery pathway functions as efficiently as possible and that we're dealing with barriers to make sure that we're getting the housing that we need coming forward, both market and, and social housing, to meet the needs of, of our residents, to avoid people having to uh, you know, drive long distances in, into Hertfordshire to help support and service our economy. So those are the key themes we've been working on this year. I apologise, this is a bit of a busy slide, um, but the, the slides will be circulated after the meeting. But just to explain, part of our focus has been on two strategic growth corridors, east-west, one in the north and one in the south of the county, where the majority of our growth and infrastructure investment is happening or is proposed to happen now and in the future. And that's that's the logic. They are, these are strategically important growth areas within the county. So we've organised the work of the Growth Board around two corridor programme boards, both politically led, and each have oversight of a range of projects being worked on by teams uh, to maintain that, that Growth Board oversight, help and support advocacy for those projects and to take that long-term perspective about the delivery of the growth in those corridors. Uh, Linda Hazy, Councillor Linda Hazy, leader of East Hearts and Councillor Sharon Taylor, leader of Stevenage, are the two political leads. We have other chief executives and leaders involved in all of the projects. Uh, just to pull out some, in the Southern Corridor, clearly we've got some significant growth locations happening there at Harlow Gilston Garden Town at Hemel Garden Communities, at Watford Junction Quarter Regeneration, at Brookfield Garden Village in Broxbourne. Between them, they account for 
you know, close on 30,000 additional new homes in Hertfordshire over the next uh, to the middle of the 2030s. So really strategically important. And al although they are being worked on, supported as projects by their individual authorities, they are partnership projects that require uh, the Highway Authority, the Growth Board, the local authority and the partners from the sector, the construction and development sector, to work together effectively and to work together lobbying government for support. So it really does need that joining up and convening activity to make sure we're supporting uh, the growth that's happening in Hertfordshire at the moment. And we've got other projects which you'll have um, heard about and obviously seen, like the Hertfordshire and Essex Rapid Transit Scheme, which are the county council are leading on but is a key project in terms of infrastructure to help and support that growth and future growth beyond the mid 2030s so it's it's a coherent set of programs and projects uh, that will support the delivery of these strategic corridors what have we done over the last year or so these are just a few of the things that the growth board has taken forward i'll just pull out some of the highlights um, all the councils agreed that we would move to a statutory joint committee for the growth board and that was established in January 2021 and then as I mentioned earlier we extended the co-opted membership to include Homes England and the independent chair of the ICS back in September. That has also put the growth board on a much more open transparent and accountable footing so residents, businesses, people in Hertfordshire, business, government can see what we're doing and it, you know it's a much more accountable form of governance than we had before and has been successfully operated uh, this year. We've obviously done a lot of work around the work programme as you can see from the list of projects that are happening. Um, that has a project management organisation around it with political and chief executive lead and sponsorship covering all the projects. We've started on the North East and Central joint planning work we produced guidance for town centres when they opened back in April. We produced a growth and housing prospectus that we're in discussion with government about to try and secure funding from Homes England's Affordable Homes Fund into a range of sites across Hertfordshire, housing sites that is. We submitted a, a expression of interest to government to become a county deal pilot. And although we're all waiting for the white paper, We'll have to see whether or not um, at some future point Hertfordshire will be able to move forward uh, with a county deal. But we've done some great, you know, political cross party working, uh, you know, leaders spoke direct to government about, you know, how we're working collaboratively with the growth board. So we've, we've done a huge amount uh, on Hertfordshire's behalf to, to really get the message about the ambition for Hertfordshire out there. Officers are working on joint housing collaboration work at the moment. And on the 11th of November, we had the first meeting of the Hertfordshire Infrastructure and Development Board. That's a strategic level engagement board with the construction, infrastructure and development sector and leaders, chief executive, planning portfolio holders to be able to have, I think, frank and open discussions about how we deliver sustainable growth in Hertfordshire, our expectations from the sector, their expectations from us and how we can really together look at you know a net carbon change to this county and form of development that's to the quality and standard that we're looking for and recognizing you know what help and support the sector needs from us to make that happen so those are those are the things we've been doing in 2021 this is a slide and neil will cover this when he presents to you next but i think the point i'd just like to make is to talk about how closely the growth board and the LEP have been working, each with their own areas. Uh, the growth board's focused mainly on place-based place responses and growth. Uh, the LEP have been leading on skills, business support, inward investment, economic strategy. Uh, but this is, is just showing you the, the work programme and the many areas of intersection between the work that the Growth Board is doing and, and the LEP and how we're making sure we're really joining up economic strategy with place-based work in Hertfordshire. Just to focus on housing for a moment, delivering the homes that Hertfordshire need is a key theme for the Growth Board. We have a problematic housing market in Hertfordshire, which will be familiar to all of you. The government has had a great focus on housing numbers and that's been a key um, 
challenge with delivering local plans in Hertfordshire. The Growth Board commitment is a much broader one, supporting sustainable growth and delivering that high quality placemaking. And that is absolutely the covenant with local residents that we will deliver good growth in Hertfordshire as part of that acceptance of the levels of growth that we, we have to deal with. And I've mentioned before, we've got some strategic scale development and regeneration happening across Hertfordshire. So it's not simple and easy growth that we're delivering. We've garden towns, garden communities, town centre regeneration, new villages, urban extensions. We have a, a significant range of models of growth to deliver, all that need skilled um, staff, you know, good partnership relationships with, with the construction sector, excellent negotiating. You know, there's, there's a range of capacity and support that we need with a growth agenda as complex and diverse as this. Uh, so that's another reason really why working in partnership across the growth board is so important. This slide is just showing you another component of that housing delivery picture. Um, Hertfordshire's objectively assessed need for housing collectively uh, is a figure you'll be aware of, the 100,000 homes by around the mid 2030s. The red line shows you the current delivery trajectory, which is at around 5,000 a year. The delivery trajectory we need to be hitting is around 7,000 new homes a year. So we have a challenge to lift that delivery performance up to that 7,000 a year. And we also know that our strategic sites uh, will be coming on stream around the middle of this decade, and they have a long lead in and need significant support from all partners to make sure that they, they can happen, have the infrastructure uh, be designed, have all the components, the stewardship, the biodiversity net gain, all the elements that we need for them to be sustainable and high quality places. So this is one of our challenges, increasing the delivery throughput without uh, detrimentally affecting the quality of output that we're looking for. Obviously, we've got options to use offsite manufacture and this needs to be part of the solution for Hertfordshire's scaling up of its growth. And the LEP have a project at the Enterprise Zone, Hertfordshire Innovation Quarter, down in southwest Hertfordshire at Maylands. Um, so we've been doing some work as well to try and help get the word out around the increased use of offsite manufacture. So developing a pattern book for design. We're doing a guidance document for local planning authorities so that the use of off-site manufactured units and that technology is fully understood and can be embraced and kind of busts the myths around the, the quality and the benefits of using off-site manufactured elements. And then the links with the whole sustainability net carbon agenda uh, through the Future Hertfordshire um, work stream the Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership, we're mainstreaming the implementation of some of the work that they're doing through the growth that's being delivered. So making sure that the standards and the intelligence that we have around biodiversity net gain, water conservation, and measures to decarbonise transport in Hertfordshire are taken through the growth that we're planning. Uh, I think the convening power of the Growth Board should be one of the really strongest components of the collaboration that we're making sure we're joining up all these various activities in Hertfordshire, seeing the opportunities, not missing them, and making sure that we are joining things up where that's to the advantage of our place. I think that's the end of my presentation, so I'll stop sharing. And Chair, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Bex. Uh, a huge amount of work there, obviously. Uh, I think the uh, the board slightly hides its light under a bushel to some extent because um, members of the public, I think, would have no idea of the extent of work that's going on. So, very good. Yes, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, um, the, the working together to deliver the homes Hertfordshire needs. Obviously, you've mentioned working with the district councils. Does that mean there will be a sort of minimum standard that builders have to achieve? So if it goes through a planning committee and 
East Hearts or St Albans or wherever, that that minimum standard, which I don't know, it might mean air source heat pumps or electric car chargers or whatever, that it'll be the same in Gilston as it will be in Hemel. I, I think that should be our ambition. Um, what the opportunity exists at a growth board level and through the sustainability partnership to provide a new evidence base and guidance and strategies for local planning authorities to implement alongside their local plans. So, so as you know, local plans set the, set the formal development plan strategy, but there are opportunities when you have new evidence and information, particularly around, you know, the sustainable uh, sustainability and homes construction agenda to lift that standard from your local plan. We're all obviously waiting to see what the, the reforms to the building regulations will do, because that will make it a legislative requirement to achieve a number of these standards. But there are things we can do above that. Whether or not you would want, I mean, there will be some basic standards I think you would want for all homes in, in Hertfordshire. Um, there are things like design criteria we might want to do across Hertfordshire to help and support the, the beauty agenda, for example. So I think there is that convening opportunity to pr produce new evidence, new guidance and strategies to sit alongside local plans for councils to use. And I think the ambition would be to lift standards in Hertfordshire as, as far as we could. So do you think some developers, you know, might think, oh, well, we can get away with doing, you know, less in one part of Hertfordshire and, and with, we're, we're, we're having to do more in another? Or do you think that's unlikely? Uh, well, my, my, my long experience of, of working with developers, um, you know, I think we've got to set the, set the bar bar high and we've got to be resolute in the standards that we look, look for. But we've also got to work with them as a sector. Um, and Linda Hazy was very clear. It, it's a real opportunity having the new Hertfordshire Infrastructure and Development Board to have those frank conversations. Linda was very clear on behalf of, of the Growth Board about you know, the, the quality that we're looking for. And Richard was very clear about the sustainability standards that we're, we're looking for. So I think we've, we've got to set our stall out on what we expect and work very hard to follow that through to secure it. But we've also got to understand the motivations of the, the construction sector and work with them, you know, to enable them to deliver what we're looking for. So it's it's not it's not an easy process, but we've actually absolutely got to be up for it and, and fight for the best for our, our communities and residents. And just one other a quick question. You referred to temporary accommodation provision across hearts. What do you mean by temporary accommodation? What's that for? So this is a, a district and borough function uh, for, for housing for home, homeless uh, people who find themselves in a situation of homelessness. It's the first project of genuine uh, collaborative working across all the teams and the councils in Hertfordshire to look at other ways we can provide this form of temporary accommodation in a more um, effective manner by working together, provide a better quality, um, build it ourselves, look and investigate a range of options for temporary accommodation provision. There are over a thousand households in temporary accommodation in Hertfordshire, many who have children, so this is a project to investigate whether by working together we can deliver that temporary accommodation better. That's not to detract from some of the really good work that's going on in the temporary accommodation area by a number of our councils, but it is to learn from that and also to build on, you know, is there a strength in, in providing some of this together, not to separate people from the communities where they currently are, but, but to see if we can actually do better by working together. So it's, you know, that that's the nature of the project. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Sandy, next. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Patsy. Very interesting. I suspect that increasingly the word growth will sit uncomfortably with the zero carbon or even net negative carbon agenda, and we may be thinking more about expressing ourselves in terms of quality of life and what we want is the highest quality of life but it might involve zero growth i suspect i mean you've painted a picture of socialism in one county um but obviously there are neighboring counties and indeed the beast of london are there equivalent bodies 
that you engage with or is that done through other mechanisms? I'm just intrigued. I mean, just across the border, you've got chief execs in uh, or, or leaders of councils in Cambridgeshire and Buckinghamshire and um, Bedfordshire. Um, how do how do you engage with them or, or do we just not do that? No, we, we engage in many different directions. So through bodies like England's Economic Heartland, they are the subnational transport body. So we you know, engage with them in terms of government investment, strategic planning for, for transport access, train provision. You know, there, there's a range of uh, interactions there. We engage into and with government on a number of levels and through a number of departments. Uh, we have we're part of the UK Innovation Corridor, so that corridor from Cambridge to to, to London, and the Innovation Core, which is centred around Harlow. Uh, we obviously meet and talk to our opposite numbers at the counties around us. So, Harlow, Gilston, Garden Town, for example, is a partnership of two counties, three districts, two LEPs, uh, two developers. So we have a number of partnerships like that. Uh, we are represented on the East of England Local Government Association. So we're, you know, we, we have, I think Owen is the lead chief exec for that body and Richard is the chair of the sustainable board within ILGA. So we have many, I, I'm doing an inadequate job of listing the many partnerships and bodies that we interact with. You're absolutely right. So we have a, a, a kind of regional picture, not just inward to Hertfordshire. But we and we do we want to know what people are doing out there and where it's to our advantage to partner up with them. So that that is a key part of our activity, really, that horizon scanning and forming and being partners where that's to the advantage of Hertfordshire. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned about um, digital. Um, can you elaborate on what you're actually asking for in that context? And I'm looking at it, asking you from a high level point of view initially um, and then to develop it from there. So the real expert on the digital area is Neil, who's up next. So if you don't mind, if I give you a short answer, but Neil, Neil, I'm giving him a hospital pass here, but I'm sure he won't mind. Um, through through the work of uh, through the team that have been looking at the digital work, we've it's become very apparent that Hertfordshire is behind where it should be in terms of comparative counties, uh, in 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 terms of the the rollout and the operators' activity within Hertfordshire. We're dominated by one particular operator, so we clearly need to do some significant work to to move to where we should be in comparison to other counties and other regions around us. So the development of a strategy and action plan have been the key role to kick that work off, setting up a team within HCC, working with LEP colleagues and supported by the Growth Board are things that are going to the Growth Board on the 6th of January to, to hopefully be agreed and supported. Neil, can I ask you to hand, just to give Nigel perhaps the top five things that, or in the uh, the action priorities. Yep, happy to, Patsy. I mean, you, I think you've covered it broadly, but I think the first priority is, is as Patsy alluded, is the infrastructure side. So it's understanding it, it, before we can talk about utility of of digital in any way, shape, or form. It's getting the infrastructure in place. And actually, we did we held a lot of um, industry engagement events, speaking to all the providers, understanding the barriers to growth. And actually, that was really real insight into sort of. The, the sort of fragmented nature where they see Hertfordshire as opposed to other lo locations, the, the fact that some players actually is a dis having such a high prevalence of market share is a disincentive to other providers. So we're really getting a more nuanced feel as to why Hertfordshire actually, when you compare it to some of our home county neighbours, we're quite far down the, um, the evolutionary scale in terms of full fibre to the premise. So that that's that's been the initial focus and where the digital board which will be working on that will have commercial players it will have other public sector will have planning authorities i think the other th in order the other element to that is making sure as as the growth board and as planning authorities that we ensure that we are having a balance but 
progressive approach to in, ensuring that rollout of digital fiber is endemic in any development and is sort of and in, we're moving any barriers to that i think once we that first focus is out of the way it's then there's a huge element around skills around the digital divide in terms of some of the ability for some people to enter the labor market as it increasingly looks to have digital skills base so what can we do for certain uh, members of our sort of communities to help them uh, reach that digital divide and then the other bit is around businesses and particularly SMEs taking up more digital routes in terms of the way their business processes run, in terms of their adaptation of technology. So they're, they're kind of more linear routes, but focus on infrastructure and then it's about the utilisation. And there's a kind of another piece of work which Patsy has alluded to, which will be one of the things we'll be looking at as part of our approach to sectors, is the actual digital sector in Hertfordshire. So we have we have sort of big players, you know, digital companies like Ocado. We've got bits of Apple, Imagination Technologies. What is what can the industry do to help address some of these issues? Okay, I am particularly interested in the future. If you could elaborate on that at some time, potentially in the future. One comment I have got, um, and I've just got my notes up here, is um, that I've heard um, from um, someone. I won't say who, that in some cases, new developers of houses are preventing BT from putting its own ducts in the road so it can actually access all the houses without putting poles up and wires. And effectively, they're trying to create a local monopoly in that housing estate. Um, I don't know, I haven't been able to validate that, but for instance, are we making it requirements or would we make it a requirement that when new properties are built, the actual trunking that goes in the road is effectively open access so anyone can put a cable or a fibre down there um, rather than having someone control it and uh, uh, cause a monopoly. Yep. Yeah, that, that's one of the issues that, that specifically arose. And one of the things we're looking at, for example, is securing some funding because there's various DCMS pots available as well as some existing let capital reserves to actually um, not subsidise that, but ensure that that the there isn't that kind of um, monopoly of the infrastructure, and that we make sure that the particularly the ducting fibre, which is the most um, sensible and sustainable route forward, um, is is open access. Uh, I think some of that can be addressed in sort of planning policy, and some of it can be addressed in incentivisation with the market players. Yeah, thank you. I think it needs to be done sometime. So. I look forward to hearing further from you on that matter. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Annie, Annie next. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Patsy, this is so exciting and so joined up and, and congratulations for what you've done so far and your ambition going forwards. Um, I've got just three areas I'd like just to ask a little bit about. Um, when we were talking about um, uh, liaising with bordering authorities, I just wonder if um, any of you ever thought about coming to one of the Luton Airport Consultative Committee meetings, I'm vice, no, I'm vice chairman on that, because um, what is so exciting is that you're going to be able to, um, well, Stansted probably as well is, is probably an impact there, but because everything is coming out of Bedfordshire, they're not really understanding the impact we have within Hertfordshire. And um, I'm not sure whether the um, heart mass transit system would help here. It's not just, it's not planned to go to Luton Airport, but at the moment they have no surface access solution to get into the airport. In fact, the meetings tonight, the planning meeting is tonight about taking them to 19 million passengers a year, which actually opens the door to the DCO for doubling it again. So I think it's really important we defend our county on that one, but. I, they probably haven't heard from you. I don't know. You, that's something you might be able to um, touch on. The other two were, from what I've been told, um, a lot of our issues uh, in this county, as probably many others, is not so much a lack of housing. It's the sifting of housing. A lot of people are can't find, if you like, upmarket downsizing because developers are building new homes for uh, young people. And uh, we went up, Scott came up with us to look at a remarkable retirement village up in, I think we were in Stratford-Pont Avon. So that, Stratford-Pont Avon, it was somewhere like that, um, that was quite astonishing. Uh, so I don't know whether those sorts of things are planned within Hertfordshire. 
And the last thing is just uh, to understand a little bit when you said that some of the advice you gave to reinvigorate our town centres, particularly, I assume, after COVID, the rebuild. I wonder what sort of advice you've been giving and how it differs between the different types of uh, towns. Um, and that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Chair, if you're right, I'll, I'll, I'll start in reverse order if that's OK and any of that. So we, we have a work stream on revitalising town centres led by uh, Councillor Tony Kingsbury and Elizabeth Dennis Harburg, leaders of uh, well in Hatfield and, and North Hearts with, with a, an officer group. And they've been um, supported by the Institute of Place Leadership, Place Management, uh, which I think are part of Manchester University, doing some, some work with them. And what they're looking at is advice and guidance, because clearly we've got a range of types of town centres and high streets in Hertfordshire. They're not all the same and we couldn't do a one size fits all approach, but we probably could do a number of things would fit all a, approach and some bespoke components. So they're looking at the moment at um, a, a project around 10 key uh, town centres and high streets in Hertfordshire to, to see if we can do some further work at a one to one level with those areas through that work stream. I'd be really happy to uh, if I can send you some more detail sort of outside of this meeting about where they're going with that and when that's likely to be available. Um, but but that's one of the work streams we've got running um, with political and, and oversight and senior officer uh, sponsorship, specifically working on helping our high streets post COVID. You're absolutely right. Um, you were asking about if I call it housing for older people, that's not a derogatory term for it. It's the sort of housing we're all going to need at some point in our life. But um, that's most definitely an issue that through the growth board and working with the local planning authorities, we need to engage in on that supply side. Why aren't we delivering more in Hertfordshire? What are the barriers to that? And it does feel like with town centre regen and the other issues we're grappling with, it's an ideal opportunity to make sure we've got that diversity of supply. And we are, we have a problem with supply. That figure I quoted to you of we're delivering 5,000 a year and we should be delivering 7,000 a year is indicative of there's a shortage on the supply side. Um, so we, we need to look at all options for broadening that, including use of offsite manufacture. So that housing for older people is definitely an area we need to do more and we are looking at. Um, the London Luton Airport, we have relied on the good offices of the County Council to be making its representations rather than the growth board independently. So, so far we have not made a representation, but obviously the County Council has made, flagged its concerns about surface access issues and lack of a coherent approach there to deal with the, the numbers at Luton. So I hope that answers your question, but I'll come back on the, the high streets work separately, if I may. Yeah, astounding answers. Thank you, Patsy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Annie. Um, Paul, uh, last question on this. Thank you. Um, I've got, to, I think, an observation and, and, and then a question. Um, so the observation, I think, is that um, the it, it kind of falls out from Sandy's earlier observation about, um, you know, the, the um, tension between uh, climate and um, growth, uh, and the the idea of having Hertfordshire Growth Board as the objective being clearly growth. Um, now, uh, what kind of falls out from that for me and from your presentation is that the kind of the the somewhat direct emphasis on housing numbers, housing delivery. Um, you know what? What we what I was what I thought was quite notable was uh, there wasn't an equivalent um, demand uh, coming down. I would argue from national government for a twenty percent because it is a twenty percent uplift in uh, the number of dwellings in in Hertfordshire, an equivalent twenty percent uplift and a structure for delivering that in both infrastructure and indeed jobs. And 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 I, and I and I do wonder about the tension, particularly between Hertfordshire Growth Board and the LEP, in terms of delivering the jobs and infrastructure that those houses will require. Because to be blunt, I don't see 
a huge amount of I don't see an equivalent um, demand and emphasis from government on delivering those aspects of what um, growth would need to facilitate it. What we're likely to see, in my view, is a, is a log jam of congestion across Hertfordshire, um, you know, because we're not seeing that uplift in infrastructure and seeing that uplift in, in local employment. Um, so that, I suppose that's my observation. Um, the, the, the question that I would have is, um, could you perhaps give us some insight into what it what specifics the Hertfordshire Growth Board have done within the last three to six months in terms of, you know, the detail of some of this uh, strategy and what you're particularly uh, working on. And I appreciate there are subgroups and so on. But uh, if, if what I hope um, happens is that this becomes a regular item on the panel, then it's that kind of detailed update that we're going to be, I think, looking for, isn't it? Thank you, Paul. Um, may I make an observation on your observation and then try try and answer your, your question? I mean, I you know, I, I totally agree there there is a there is a tension there between the you know our responsibilities in, in relation to climate change and and you know net zero and growth. And I think it's our job to try and work through that and also find a way of describing maybe growth's always been a hard sell. Don't need me to tell you that as a as a counsellor. However, it is something that we need. We need to grow our economy, uh, and you know we have we have housing needs in this county to meet. So there's there's no getting away from that. But I think how we deliver that and how we describe the outputs that we're trying to achieve are fundamentally important in the in the narrative around this this work. So you know responsible, caring growth, so that and with infrastructure at the right time, though you know. I appreciate these things are harder to deliver than they are to say, but those are absolutely the ambitions, the things that we should be working towards and trying to secure. Um, you know, it's not just growth for growth's sake, and it's not just a housing numbers game in Hofstra. It's it's got to be, you know, that that rounded the right kind of growth for our place, and we we need to work very hard to um, get that message out and make that clear. That's the standards we're looking for. It's, it's not an unbalanced growth picture in Hertfordshire because there is a requirement to deliver around 100,000 new jobs as well as the homes. And Neil will come on, you know, to a lot of kind of where that's happening. Um, and there is a place based component to that. So we do need to work together. There's not a conflict between the growth board and the LEP. I think actually the joint work we've been trying to do both to secure infrastructure to. So the Hearts, a classic example. Um, 50,000 homes uh, in our 100,000 homes target lie within a very short distance of the route of where the heart will go. You know, that's a, a key opportunity and not an easy project to deliver by any stretch of the imagination, but it will enable sustainable decarbonised transport solutions to come forward in future. And it will give us growth location opportunities better served by active transport if we've got a system like that. In, in you know southern southern Hertfordshire so I think we've got to be ambitious around what are the things that are going to help us deliver more sustainable growth but I don't think there's any way of getting around it unless we to be frank stop living as long as we are doing stop having children stop living in smaller households you know these things are driven by the way we live today I didn't set these up nor did you know that we've got to recognize we generate needs in Hertfordshire and we have to address them in the in the right kind of way. Um, that was my can observation. I, can, um, I, can I uh, observe something about your observation? The first is that um, you appear to be conflating um, uh, economic development growth and and um, society growth with spatial growth. And actually, perhaps one of the ways that you can um, de reduce the tension between the um, the sustainability aspects, the, the climate aspects and, and the requirement for economic and, and um, you know, cultural development is to decouple the spatial and the spatial growth from economic growth, because the two are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, so that, that was one, one of the other things I, I, I would sort of observe on that, really. 
Um, I, I think it, you're totally correct in terms of what the digital agenda might might help us with. People don't necessarily need to be in the same you know workplace when they can work from home with that. But a lot of people, you know, there's there's still an element of you know be quite a lot of people who will still need to be at their workplace. Mm -hmm. I guess perhaps I put it rather clumsily. There is a relationship between housing and our economy. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we our economy needs homes. We've had that feedback. We understand that relationship. So in crude terms, that that was where I was drawing the linkage. You know, the two need to be looked at together. And, you, you, you know, we won't be able to continue to support the growth of our clusters and the emerging clusters without addressing some of our housing issues at the same time. That's that's how I kind of straightforwardly, simply would would see that. I don't think we're disagreeing. Um, fundamentally there. Your question about the specifics, what have we done over the last few months, the growth board? So we've uh, an investment strategy that is going to the growth board in, in January. So setting out that framework for how we want to bring investment into Hertfordshire. We are commissioning a, uh, a master plan framework for the Gunnels Road area in Stevenage to help support the, the cell and gene investment that's happening around there. So really looking at a place-based way uh, about how we can we can help new companies go to that part of Stevenage. Um, we've done, as I said, the the work on opening up the high streets with the cell and with the media and TV sector, we've worked with the LEP on getting a greater understanding of how many sites are needed for new film studios so that the local planning authorities can really consider what that means for future local plans and the joint strategic planning work. We've set up the Infrastructure and Development Board and that's had its meeting. We've, we've been through all the process of sorting out the governance there. Um, we did the work on supporting the submission of interest to become a pilot county deal area. And I'm not even mentioning kind of all the other ecosystem of projects the temporary accommodation work that's working through outline business case. So we've got lots of things happening. We're probably not very good, as Stephen said, about really getting the messaging out there about all the work we're doing. But there, there's a regular update goes to the growth board every time, which would be very happy to, to share with the, the panel separately and come back regularly to provide you an update on. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy and Paul. Right. The, um, we are to note the contents of the report. If you're all happy to do so, please show us noted in the chat. Thank you. That's uh, pretty well noted. <laughs> and thank you, Patsy. Thank you very much, everyone. So the next item is the Hertfordshire Let Update from Neil Hayes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I also have a few slides uh, uh, that will hopefully build on some of the previous discussion. Um, so I will, I will focus the discussion on some of those issues uh, where possible. Um, the two, uh, two areas I, I'm going to update uh, members on is partly is the economic situation, the dashboard as, as part of my usual update. And then I'm actually going to focus a bit on the sector work, uh, building on some of the conversations that, and questions that have arisen from members, but updating on progress in relation to that work and where it's going next. Uh, first of all, in terms of the, the general economic situation, uh, I think our economy is uh, bouncing back in reasonable fashion. Um, unemployment is just slightly above uh, at four percent, slightly above where we were going into the pandemic back in March 2020, which I think was around 3.7. And obviously, compared to where we were at one point projecting unemployment to be at 12 percent, um, is nowhere near that. Um, Long-term annual growth is not necessarily something we can predict uh, in any great scientific detail locally, but we think it's probably there or thereabouts the same as the, both the region in terms of the east of England and the UK. Obviously, this, this, these slides will be circulated to members to look at in more detail. Um, I guess in terms of constraints that um, 
I would I would argue were probably there before COVID and remain um, uh, coming out of the well, as we can uh, far as we can tell, coming out of the situation is wage rates in Hertfordshire remain comparatively high to other parts of the country, uh, which are now becoming a constraint in some of the sectors that are sort of wanting to grow, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, we can see in terms of average house prices in Hertfordshire is 435,000 compared to the UK 270. Um, uh, whilst the, the growth year on year has been smaller than uh, other, both the east of England and the UK, it's still a very high base. Um, and I think interestingly, actually our business base uh, shrank uh, over the past 12 months uh, considerably more than uh, both the east of England and the UK. Um, so we lost a lot of uh, micro businesses, um, but I think it can also be characterised as, you know, Hertfordshire has been successful over the years in having a lot of startups, some of which have a natural life cycle and they, you know, the churn over three years, they don't necessarily all last, but that kind of throughput of micro businesses and startups is generally high and one of the characteristics of our economy now that over the past 12 months or so has faltered whether that's people deciding with the current economic uncertainty they'll go for a, a back into employment rather than setting up a business or the, the the uncertainty obviously will have a major effect on that it's too early to tell but that's one on our kind of um our strategy board will be looking at the lap as to is this merely something that will be rectified over a period of time or is it something we need to focus more attention on in terms of getting back up getting back out there and encouraging startup of businesses because i think a healthy throughput of startup and micros has always been good in terms of the hertfordshire economy so that's an area of focus um i'll just go through the three key issues and, and again it, it touches on many of the things that were discussed by members in patsy's presentation the kind of underlying weaknesses of our economy are sort of uh, their back, as it were. So the, the workforce availability in some of those key sectors um, and uh, I think some of the sector growth plans I'm going to talk about will exacerbate some of that unless we begin to address some of those key skills challenges. Employment space. Um, I, I've been obviously previously uh, talking about lack of employment space as a key issue. I think this is one which is now being raised more fully within the growth board and not just the LEP talking about it. It's, it's an issue that needs to be addressed, particularly if we want to factor in the opportunity of um, some of the growth I'll talk about shortly. Housing affordability. And I think um, the sort of variable economic performance across place. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you take Hertfordshire as a single economic unit and just look at the statistics for that economic unit, you think, you know, things are fine. But that masks... You know, polarised economic performance. So some of our districts and boroughs you know, historically have performed uh, more poorly than others. And I think what we're seeing coming out of the COVID um, pandemic is some of those sort of, some of that polarisation has been compounded. So the areas that have struggled um, uh, haven't necessarily bounced back as quickly as areas that have been uh, historically more resilient. So I think in terms of where we need to go next, it's this long-term approach around fruit future growth opportunities. I'm going to talk about two of those sector plans shortly. Um, I think it's about transitioning both people and places to, to ban benefit from that anticipated growth. Um, and how do we engineer that? And that's the part of the LEP and of the partners to make sure that we catch up with the private sector um, and we, we move with them and we uh, accelerate that investment, but also make sure that we're not a constraint on the economy. And increasing this whole connectivity that it, uh, the building on what we were talking about just previously with the growth board presentations around anticipating those future needs and actually how can going back to some of the discussion we talked about earlier how can improving uh, a, a modest improvement in our digital infrastructure actually alleviate some of the other pressures we're, we're in terms of transport infrastructure etc cetera, etc cetera, in the county so I'll, what i'll then go through is a, a talk about some of these sector focused growth and some of you may have uh, attended the recent event that we held at Warner Brothers on film and TV. I'll talk through some of the some of the editor highlights there and film and Sal and Jean. This is an, an approach that we're working 
within the growth board. So all the what's happening with the results of all of this are not only that you know, the LEP to lead on it for other, other partners to take forward within the confines of the growth board, but also this is a uh, a process that we will also be undertaking with other sectors in the county over the course of next year. So basically, the, the process is we take an evidence based look at you know where the sectors are, you know what are the key opportunities, what are the constraints, have a number of industry based discussions. So speaking to both major players, SMEs, uh, uh, medium sized businesses, trying to understand you know get a more of a flavour for what that means in terms of where, what we need to address in terms of policy drivers. And what will be moving forward will be action plans. So I'll start with film and TV. Uh, and this is a, a map that's showing some of the evidence base work we've been doing around the uh, sort of amber uh, dots are existing film studios. So you can kind of see a spread. It's not necessarily entirely clear, but you know, Hertfordshire um, has a number of uh, studios, as you yes, as you're more than well aware with. There's also the kind of stretch of Kind of Shepparton, Pinewood is that here, number nine. So historically, that kind of stretch from uh, north and west of London out into Hertfordshire has been the predominant base of the film and TV industry. And obviously, there's been significant growth in in uh, both Pinewood and Shepparton um, through the sort of changes in the way um, uh, the digital, particularly digital platforms, are, are uh, driving in a, a, a huge demand for content. The green dots are demonstrating more where the sort of anticipated future growth is. So, as you can see, this includes the Sky Studios in Elstree, as well as Elstree Studio expansion, Sunset Studios in Broxbourne, but also increasingly into sort of that A10 corridor, stretching down into Enfield, adjacent to Broxbourne, those OMA X film studios. Um, you're seeing a kind of a shift further east in terms of the the, the 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 spread of the sector, which I think is is good. And at, at the centre, it all is Hertfordshire. So I think that consolidates our position as a centre of the growth of the film and TV industry in the country. Um, just some some statistics here in terms of the evidence base. So back a decade ago, we had around 350 screen businesses, and I'll I'll caveat that with the industry itself is very hard to pinpoint. It predominantly freelance. It's highly skilled. Um, it's kind of uh, yeah, the, the workforce is still London and Hertfordshire and home counties centric. Around fifty percent of it is self-employed. So actually trying to map the sector is is challenging enough. And going through sort of routes and national agencies is is what we've been trying to do. So, but over the past ten years, we think that has almost tripled to around nine hundred screen related businesses in the county. And over the next decade, if you're looking at that, at the existing planned studio expansion adds another 70% of you know, studio facilities in the county, you would assume that would grow even further over the next 10 years. Uh, we're obviously benchmarking ourselves with some of our neighbours um, in terms of neighbouring LEP areas as well, just that relate to the sector. Um, and we, uh, across excluding London, but across those home counties, we've got the largest sector across the southeast, around 3,000 jobs locally. And again, with additional studio expansion, if that all bears fruit and some of the stuff that's in the sort of planning pipeline um, is realised, it could potentially be in an additional six to 13,000 jobs. So again, significant numbers. And if you look in the, the diagram to the top, the bottom uh, right, you can see the location quotient is a techie uh, um, characteristic. It's basically the the precedence of uh, employment in that sector. So if you have a location quotient of want, you've got the, the UK average number of people in film and TV. So if you look at Three Rivers, it's 5.2. It's about five times the average uh, than you would get in uh, compared to, to the rest of the country. And that's even bigger than other neighbouring areas. So, you know, but then followed by Hartsmere and surprisingly, and then you've got uh, Buckinghamshire, which is obviously a unitary county. So the whole of that county has uh, 2.3 and then Spellthorne, which is essentially Shepparton, is 1.7. We want to see those numbers grow and we think we've got every opportunity to do so. What I won't do in order for time is to go through all of these details. Um, but where we've got to at the moment is we're, we're, we've, we've established a series of um, actions uh, we, we're working through. Um, these, these actions 
actually haven't been to the let board yet we've got a board meeting next week so you've got um first sight of some of these recommendations that are going to the board in terms of where we, we go forward in summary you know the big challenge for skill uh, for um, t film and tv is skills uh, it's about making sure that we've got throughput of people against those skills as that studio capacity gets cranked up over the next year to two years so it's about how do we make sure that we have enough people coming into the into the labour market? Can we transition people from other bits of the labour market into those areas? And actually demystifying uh, a lot of it and working with the industry to, to sort of work through the, the actual specific skills, which in many cases are, you know, craft and design, um, you know, traditional trade skills, accountancy, finance. There are a number of things that, that actually, uh, you know, the process-wise, are traditional what i would call uh, sectors and skills that we have in the county but tailored slightly towards the way the film and tv sector operate so um you know it it, it was a really um interesting comment by one of the studios that said you know we need carpenters but we don't need carpenters that build um structures that can last you know for years we need carpenters that can build things in a certain way that can be taken up and taken down within the space of three weeks so it's a, it's a not 80 percent of the skill set is you know, is there it's the 20 percent that specifically meets the needs that we need to address i think there's also about making sure that we can grow some businesses that fragmentation piece is really an issue in the county in the fact that it's all based on freelancers and if you want to become into the market you don't you can't as well as having a particular expertise that you can bring to the table there needs to be a set of business skills to operate as a freelance that we need to put in place to help people um, into the market as it were so what, you know, what are those kind of general freelance characteristics that we need to need to address there's still an incessant demand for space at this point in time we envisage that will at some point will slow down but we're still seeing demands for space i think the opportunity that we'll be moving towards as we grow the kind of critical mass is the ancillary space not all of it is studio space we need uh, business space we need warehousing space as the as the industry grows and it's the again it's it's housing that wider sector that supports the industry is where we need to sort of focus on next um i think going back to some of the other discussions you know environmental performances i think is, is going to be a challenge moving forward it's not necessarily the most sustainable industry and how do we in hertfordshire you know work towards setting the standard around uh, green production uh, and reuse of materials, moving more things towards digital production and working with partners such as BRE to make sure that we can design future studio spaces to be more sustainable in some way, shape or form. Talked about digital, but there's huge issues about, you know, some of those sites needing um, very large pipes, as it were, of digital infrastructure to deal with that digital content. And not only that, um, the storage of data, you know, a lot of it comes hand in hand with, with studio uh, facilities that they need somewhere to, to store all the data. And there's a bigger issue around security of data that is increasingly as that workforce moves, works from home, the domestic infrastructure is important, but also the security of that um, uh, domestic infrastructure is, is, is important as well. And finally, there's the, the wider sort of benefit and boost that the creative and screen industry gives for Hertfordshire and the county. You know, there's a constant need for locations, and I think some of our districts are benefiting from that and, and actually seeing that as a future um, source of income. How do we how do we collaborate that? How do we combine that in, in a more uh, cooperative way? So we are maximising every opportunity of, of screen industries. I'll talk a bit about life sciences and then I'll, I'll, I'll draw to a close. As obviously we've we've talked about life sciences at previous discussion, so we we know that you know this industry has been in and around Hertfordshire for a number of years. There've been waves of investment and disinvestment, but I think particularly over the, the last ten years, particularly in the GSK campus, was was recognising that uh, the move was to more open innovation that to actually progress. Some of the big pharma companies had to. Um, essentially you know spread their bets as it were by spinning out companies providing facilities for people to start up in business um you know and that started with the bioscience camp campus opening in 2012 and the cell and gene therapy catapult manufacturing center we're all on the gsk campus in 2017 so we've reached that point now with the spin outs and the growth particularly around cell and gene 
that the R&D investment in the Stevenage cluster and the, the diagram you see on the right is the years 2017 to 2020, you can see that, um, yeah, that the Stevenage cluster is outperforming London and Cambridge in terms of R&D investment, which is huge, actually. Uh, and it's recognised as the UK's largest cluster now in cell and gene therapy and the third biggest in the world. Um, so the question is now is how do we how do we build that wider ecosystem and grow it? So the evidence base again is showing us that there are sort of two main areas, biopharmaceuticals, which is the kind of cell and gene area we were talking about before, and medical technology. So medical devices, which again is probably more spread across the county in terms of um, capacity. Uh, just, just talking about a bit about that campus, you can see where the bottom that GSK R and D hub. You now have a number of facilities that have grown. Um, earlier in the year, GSK announced there were the, the remaining elements of that that site are going to be taken forward in terms of further bioscience campus uh, developments. We're now um, having developments going into southern parts of Gullingwoods Road, and more recently, some of you may have picked up in the media around Autolus, one of the spin-outs from this whole campus, actually investing their site adjacent uh, to the top of that diagram in Marsgate Car Park. So you've got companies now moving into the rest of Stevenage to accommodate that growth. And the really encouraging signs are that they're, they're quite happy with Stevenage, they want to grow, they want to be within around 15 minutes of that, that general campus. Uh, and it's about how, how we then grow with the industry. Some of it is lab space, some of it is, you know, high value warehousing and distribution, some of it is manufacturing, and some of it is professional services as the industry grows. So, it, you know, it, it's this whole approach about how do we grow with the industry? You know, some of the developers we have been talking to as part of this approach are saying they need a million square feet over the next five to 10 years uh, in order to keep up with demands. So that is clearly a challenge. So I think the, the, the burning challenge in relation to cell and gene is actually around sites and making sure that we've got a comprehensive site strategy. And again, we're working with a growth board that's looking around that kind of 15 minute radius of that campus and making sure that it's touching not just about lab space, but all the other ancillary services that we need. Clearly, workforce is a big issue and it's about as that industry broadens its focus, the broader range of skills. It's not just about, you know, um, you know, doctorates, it's about um, technician level skills and what are the opportunities for local residents to do things like apprenticeship frameworks, working with the FE colleges, working with the university to see there are opportunities in development there. I think it's about plugging into the wider networks as one of the questions earlier about, you know, looking beyond Hertfordshire and I think that applies to both where we are via our LEP neighbours, we're having broader discussions around making sure that we can kind of collaborate more. Uh, I think there's an other issue about promoting these sectors. If we were in the parts of the country, they'd be promoting a lot more. And go back to Patsy's point about being investment ready. One of the things that we're looking at now is having a, a, a more concerted inward investment offer to uh, investors in Hertfordshire around these assets. So I'll, I'll, I'll just finish here. In terms of next steps, some of that content that you've just seen uh, in terms of the action plans and the evidence base is going to our board uh, mm -hmm. next next week. Um, we're agreeing then what let resource that we've got in terms of capital and revenue over the next two years or so that we can support this. Obviously, we'll be making bids to government for further support where possible and where funds exist. And I think importantly, we recognise that we need um, expertise within the lab to take these forward. So we need someone to push cell and gene, someone to push film and TV and actually broker those dialogues between skills providers, HEFE, local authorities and the businesses themselves. Um, and we'll publish those plans in, in January. I think importantly, we want to set up industry panels that particularly these sector coordinators will report to. And the purpose of them is, is not to have another bit of uh, governance, it's actually to have a a, a small representative sample of the industry that can check and challenge those sector plans as they uh, are developed over the course of the year. Uh, and that challenge that both the LEP, the Growth Board and other partners are actually developing plans that meet industry need. And, and, and that will be working with you know, the Skills Board, with the Growth Board, with the University and other players and essentially calling them all to account to make sure that we can meet uh, the, those future growth plans of the industry. But also, 
challenge some of the industry in terms of the way they want to grow, push them in terms of the things they need to do to uh, invest their, their own resources in future skills development and site development and green in their industries, et cetera, having more of a dialogue. I think that the idea is building on the successful conference we had last month is to have these things in as, as an annual to monitor, monitor progress. And then we'll, over 2022, we're then going into other sectors. So the advanced manufacturing sector that we've got in Hertfordshire, particularly north of the county, that whole ICT data and AI sector that we've got, you know, fragments of in Hertfordshire, but increasingly an, an area of investment. And then I think building on what we were talking about earlier, that whole low carbon agenda, we've got some assets around it, both EnviroTech in terms of key businesses. We've got the, the Enterprise Zone and we've got you know the likes of BRE Sustainable Construction. Get the evidence base, speak to industry and develop those plans to move forward. Um, I'll, I'll end the presentation there, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you for the presentation. Now, at the beginning, you said that the um, unemployment modelling that, that that we had massively over over predicted the amount of unemployment there would be due to COVID. And I was just wondering what changes have been made to that model so that it produces more useful and accurate predictions uh, going forward. Um. It's really hard, actually, because a lot of the data you get from, you know, his, you know national sources is is retrospective. So you, you're looking in the rear view mirror in terms of forecasting. We have a number of models uh, that we can plug into. There's the Cambridge model. Uh, there are other national models, that, but all of it is pretty much an, an, an assumption. I think increasingly as a let, we're looking to um, uh, flavor some of that empirical data with um, uh, other sources. So there's lots of uh, open data coming out from the likes of Google, etc. that we're we're trying to tap into. Um, so we're getting more of a current flavour that's a bit more flexible and a bit less rigid. Um, and I think um, particularly from the COVID-19 pandemic, some of those data sources have been really useful in, in us helping model where we move forward. But it's not an exact science. Um, and I think, you know, at the is time, it, is uh, it a model specific to Hertfordshire, or, or are you just using national sort of models? It, it, in terms of the forecasted stuff, it, it's basically mostly national. As a, and again, there's the Cambridge model, which is essentially the East of England model. They're the two sources that we've we've, we've generally used, uh, and and part of uh, and then the other bit will be essentially a look back on sort of historical circumstances that have been similar so previous recessions how has Hertfordshire taken a hit so therefore this is what we expect to see into numbers so again um, the danger of all of this is never an exact science but uh, we've got a reasonable amount of capability now over the past 10 years of knowing how the, the economy ticks and where it's likely to go I think the, the signs are very encouraging um, I, but I think we can't be complacent because coming into the pandemic, we knew there were some of these underlying challenges of our economy. And I think we need to address them at pace now in order to even just take up the opportunities that are in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Nigel? Uh, thank you and thank you for the presentation. I've got uh, two separate questions. You said at the beginning of the presentation, no visible signs of house price depreciation. Um, by putting that statement up there, you imply there is something or you are monitoring the house price situation. Is there signs of a slowdown, of it stalling? Um, what, what's generally speaking happening in that sector? Um, I think it's mixed. Um, again, if you take Hertfordshire as a kind of economic unit, I think the growth is around 1.6%, which is quite slow. But then particular locations, uh, the likes of Watford, St Albans, uh, I think Stevenage with the growth of the regeneration of town centre have, have have been particular areas of focus for investment. So, um, and there's actually quite useful data that we get from other sources just on the previous points, such as right move that we can sort of drill down to in terms of seeing what where the trends are. Um, so, I, I, in essence, I think you've obviously had that kind of post-COVID reaction where people want to move out of constrained flats for example in and around London to somewhere with a bit more space that they can work from home more I think Hartbridge has benefited from that um, 
but to to a certain degree that then drives the market up that then drives prices up and then that impacts on the ability of you know local residents to afford those homes there's also you know we were talking about this for example in the context of the film and tv industry that you know the benefit of you know, more of the industry coming out of Soho in for Hertfordshire with great into economic terms but the downside of that will be a migration out to the places in Hertfordshire bringing house prices up and also that you so say you'll have a secondary level of effects that are need to be balanced with the, the pure economic benefit of the studio growth and development if we're not providing that throughput of of homes to meet uh, which is wider needs you're just going to have this polarization of the market i i recognize that what i was curious about was during the height of the pandemic the government had this scheme of reducing stamp duty which obviously boosted house prices considerably at that time when there have been these short term effects in the past there's often been a rebound immediately afterwards which has in times had very disastrous effects on the housing market yeah. and i'm just sort of curious when you mentioned the word depreciation whether um you, you were sort of worried about that I, I we're not anticipating depreciation again the i think the last of those measures ended quite recently so we'd need to see the data probably quarter one next year to see what the effect has been so it, it literally um, the, the stamp duty policy, I think, ended um, the last month or so. So, we we we. It's too early to tell if that's had a, a other than anecdotal conversations with estate agents whether that's having a, a, a significant effect. I think the overall, you know, economic performance of the county, i.e., the jobs element, because we've had high jobs investment in places like. Sal and Jean and Stephen is and with the film and TV that's kind of ameliorated that kind of uh, sort of yeah. um, peak and trough as far as we can see but I, I wouldn't want to really I couldn't give you any answer with conviction until I saw the data early into the new year to be honest. Okay so let's wait and see that no, that's fine the second question I had was unrelated you mentioned about the digital um, needs of the film industry in particular the need to store data what provision or what um I'm, I'm not don't know what there is at the moment actually is there in terms of data centers dedicated towards the film industry and, and what is actually the state of that market uh so uh, in terms of the film industry specifically um, a lot of that still exists predominantly in the states in around california where a lot of this obviously the investment that we've seen is predominantly american studios into hertfordshire so some of those where you would imagine this sort of headquartering effects are still essentially in places like Burbank, California. Um, it's it's more the kind of um, the production facilities in the way that if I kind of deconstruct the way a studio works. You compare it to historically, you know, you, you building a car, you have the various components that are assembled in and around um, that, that some of, some of it is supply chain, some of it is by the by the company itself the, the actual warner brothers workforce in the studio is relatively small it's all necessarily fragmented freelancers that come in do various pieces of work and then go out and it's their needs which we're trying to understand and decipher i mean there are there's there has been a data center development plan for broxbourne which i think bodes well for the studio development i think there's one that's also in train in and around the sky studio uh, site. I think there's a data center element to that that's gone in into planning. I think there have been some that have been looking in and around um, um, around Maylands and uh, Hemel um, in in relation to that. And and obviously, it's a very real need for the industry. But we have to offset that with you know there's there, there's a carbon footprint challenge in terms of some of the, the demands of those data centers which we need to we need to balance. The, um, where I was coming with the question or what my, my thinking was, increasingly the film industry is going for higher and higher resolutions, which however you manage it causes higher and higher data volumes. Yeah. Therefore, if you are, there is an argument to say that you actually do put the data centres much more local to the film studio, at yeah. least for tactical use of the data. Um, because it's sheer volume, it will affect the internet trying to send it over the Atlantic. 
Yeah. Um, and therefore, I was trying to understand what level of work you'd done in that area to actually potentially develop a strategy and encourage local investment in that regard. So in terms of those, the kind of infrastructure pipes, as it were, they're unsurprisingly adjacent to those major arterial routes coming out of London. Yeah. So as I alluded to, the the uh, investment in Broxbourne is based on that factor. And I think the um, obviously the, the Sky Elstree development with uh, the data centre related to that is adjacent to the A1M. So I think some of the infrastructure decisions are based on the availability of the existing infrastructure as it's as it's as it as it comes out of London essentially. I think London is again. This is not an area of, of my expertise, but I understand that because of the uh, a lot of the content and source uh, is generated in London, it needs to be within a certain proximity of London in terms of safety and security in in terms of infrastructure. So, essentially, within that M25 axis where it meets um those arterial road routes is where we're seeing demand for data centers yeah uh, i was just trying to understand what you could share with me on that front and uh, i thank you for doing so so well uh, i mean what 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 we can do is all of these reports have an evidence base so we have an evidence base that's verified by independents and then there's a sector action plan so when we publish these uh, the first two what you'll see is that evidence base and as well as the action plan. And again, that has far more granular level of detail of what the component parts of the industry, which we'll be able to see. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. It's uh, very helpful. Cheers. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Sandy? Yeah, um, thank you, um, Neil. Always very interesting. I just wanted to ask about the dog that barked or didn't bark, really. Um, you know, we've concentrated so much on post-COVID but there's the B word, the Brexit word. And I just wondered, you know, thinking about particularly the cell and gene stuff, I mean, are we starting to see problems with getting the right scientists in um, from elsewhere? Indeed, even in the film stuff, are we seeing issues with sourcing the right skills or, or is Hertfordshire relatively immune to some of the obvious Brexit impacts? I think where you've got the very high growth sectors of global significance, that kind of sits above that, if I'm honest, and partly is price determinant because of the, the high value of the growth. So the you know, the, the investment in the screen industry, you know, it and to lesser degree cell gene has all has all a lot of it officially been post Brexit. So they've they've consciously made the decision, particularly the American studios, to continue to invest, and that is mostly because they see the existing workforce being the major asset, um, which isn't necessarily as mobile. I mean, you have fragments of the industry, obviously around the around the world, um, but we're not seeing. Uh, I guess cell and gene. There are certain constraints in the fact that. A lot of the work they do involves things like clinical trials and bloods. So part of the reason they're in Stevenage is because they're adjacent to you know, three major airports and the ability to, to service that um, need for um, clinical trials across Europe um, is, is one of the reasons why Stevenage was chosen. Now, whether that continues to be the case or there are pressures in relation to that, we're yet, we're yet to see. In terms of the supply chain per se, there's you know in terms of the industry conversation we're having, there's nothing. Um, we're not we're not getting any red flashing lights, shall we say? Um, but I still think it's relatively early days because it, what what this might happen is you know once these sectors which they are beginning to reach is a critical mass, the scale of the requirements suddenly kind of either multiply by a significant factor or double or treble. So the, the volume in terms of investment, in terms of demand on in, in, on space, in terms of demand on skills, suddenly and quite quickly escalate. So we, 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 we're kind of um, seeing that process pan out over the next two years, if that makes sense. So, you know, the studios haven't been built yet. 
they are being constructed at the moment, some of the lab provision and the, the spin outs haven't been built. When we get to 23, 24, that's when I think, you know, unless we start addressing some particular and skills in issues now, we won't know whether we're able to meet the, the total demands of the industry. But I think it's really important to have these plans and importantly the panels. So we're getting that regular ongoing dialogue um, that, you know, if there are issues around supply chains, there are issues around uh, workforce pressures, we can at least try and address them uh, you know, at pace. Thank you. I mean, it just emphasises the importance of places like University of Hertfordshire, doesn't it, and what they are doing in terms of that pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. And and the FE colleges, to be fair. I mean, I think it's it's breaking down some of these preconceived notions that actually a lot of this growth isn't going to benefit the general population of Hertfordshire. Actually, once you reach a critical mass, it can have a broader outreach. And I think it's our job as the let and other elements of the public sector to maximise the value of that growth and not just focus on the high end, focus on the throughput uh, in terms of jobs and opportunities uh, for people in the county. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Right. Uh, thank you, Neil. I have no other people indicating wish to speak, so um, we are to note the presentation. If you would like to do that in the chat, please. Thank you. That is noted. Uh, so item uh, five is the infrastructure funding statement and Sarah M McLaughlin will be telling us about this. Thank you and good morning. Um, so I'm presenting the second edition of the County Council infrastructure funding statement. The council's required to publish information on receipts and spend from development agreements. And members will be aware these are currently secured from Section 106 agreements with landowners across the county. This second edition covers the financial period 2020 to 21. Uh, the table on the first page of the report uh, indicates the headline figures, which are more than 40 million in receipts, almost 14 in spend and almost 85 million held in total. The vast majority of that funding is allocated to specific projects due to be spent uh, within the next 10 years. Obviously, each agreement has a different spend period as they are agreed at different times, but typically each one allows flexibility for the County Council to spend the funding within 10 years. For strategic sites, Section 106s typically have a selection of trigger points, so points in time when they will be expected to provide funding to us and other infrastructure providers. It will vary by service and relate to when projects are needed as the site is built out. For example, a large site delivering two primary schools may pay for the first one very early on in the development programme, but a staggered or phased payment might be included for the second school. There are also different leading times for infrastructure projects um, determined on a service by service basis. So whilst funding steadily comes into the council as developers hit those various trigger points, spend is not always aligned with income. We currently manage the Section 106 process through two teams. Uh, that's the highways team and the growth and infrastructure unit who manage funding on behalf of non-highway services. And the graph on page two presents a timeline of income and spend over the past 10 years. Members will probably particularly note that spend for the growth related services, which includes education, has increased twofold recently primarily reflected income for new schools as larger, more strategic sites have come forward. For example, we're holding significant sums for the schools in Bishop Stortford. The statement's split into two parts. The first sets out data on income and spend, and the second part sets out indications of future infrastructure requirements and county council statutory functions. In 2014, the legislation changed for Section 106, so all subsequent agreements require that a particular and specific use is explicitly stated in the legal agreement. One reason for that is that each obligation or funding line um, must specify how each contribution relates to the development site. So 
as an example, we couldn't secure funding for a East Hearts Primary School in a Watford Borough Council agreement. The statements also got three appendices and apologies, these weren't uploaded until late. The first of which lists the new agreement signed during the reporting period. The second lists the projects completed in the reporting period, and this includes the Avanti Meadows Primary School as part of the Bishop Stortford North development. Um, a Letchworth Garden City Library refurbishment, a Well in Hatfield Youth Centre refurbishment and a Decorum Safer Routes to School programme. Um, there are quite a few other ones indicated in the appendix. And then Appendix 3 covers new funding received, which will have been agreed in previous years. So at the end of March 21, the County Council had £85 million of funding, which is closely monitored and managed and has quite a rigorous internal process of member sign off and sometimes cabinet approval where there are bigger projects. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, receipts and income do overlap. So there will be occasions where services are waiting to secure enough income or bring enough income in. Um, it also depends on how quickly a developer is building a site because the triggers and agreements are sometimes connected to the number of occupations or completions that are happening on site. Spend on our projects might also be uh, delayed because the service is dependent on the cumulative um, development of sites coming forward, uh, which might need to trigger demand for a particular project. Um, it might be dependent on other funding mechanisms to support the project. So there may be internal county council discussions ongoing, uh, discussions with government for government funding, uh, or also um, SIL funding uh, ideas being brought forward so the community infrastructure levy that's held by a number of our local authority partners. It might also be dependent on other processes to complete prior to project delivery. So for example, the transfer of land that might be needed for a new school. There might be a need for the developer to build an access road to the land or provide connecting services before that can happen. Large single projects for which delivery is already underway, but which funding has still not, not yet been drawn down, uh, includes more than 20 million held for the Bishop Stortford North schools. Um, sometimes only part of the total funding required is held. Uh, it could be delayed due to a change in local demographics since the original agreement was signed. So, for example, a drop in admissions in, at an existing school might mean that early capacity can be met to meet a development site um, and it might slightly delay the development program for the new school being brought forward. There might also have been COVID related delays. Um, well, I think whilst we're aware, we're not really aware of any significant delays to projects that were already being delivered, it may have played a part in terms of officer time to develop schemes that, you know, they might have been diverted to other priorities during the period. So, in summary for today's report, uh, the Growth Infrastructure Planning Cabinet Panel is invited to endorse the publication of the statement, which will subsequently be published on the County Council website. Um, and just to finally note, I'm joined with uh, by David Hodbod today, who is my one of my team leaders for the Strategic Infrastructure Team. Obviously, more than happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, first question is from Paul. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I fully appreciate that uh, Section 106 contributions come in at a certain point and then are spent subsequently, and that may go over multiple years. But when you look at the table in 2.3, uh, there is a, um, a, a this is a, a snapshot from one particular year that shows the amount of revenue that we've got coming in being 40.5 million, and the amount we've managed to spend being 13.8. Now, if that is typical of um, subsequent years, what we'll see is a massive ramp up of Section 106 money uh, sitting in um, accounts and, and not being spent. So uh, can you assure me that the spend um, uh, compared to the receipts for years before or after uh, the one that we're currently looking at uh, are the other way round to this year? That's a really good point and, and really very valid. Uh, I think the Bishop Stortford North one is one I particularly mentioned because we are holding a lot of money for that. And the secondary school project at Bishop Stortford North is uh, due to start drawing money down during this financial year that we're in at the moment, actually. So in the next reporting year, we'll start to report funding for that. 
and that's in excess of 25 million, for example, for one project. So um, I think future years we'll see larger pots of money because we're holding quite a few big pots for single projects. Um, yeah. And we're working with the services to try and combine smaller pots of money to make something significant and substantial for them. Um, and also, you know, looking at other funding mechanisms that we can help them with to try and draw down money faster. But I very much take your point. Yeah, but there are some big numbers associated with specific projects. Well, I mean, I, you, just to just to come back, I mean, even the tw the full 25 million uh, still doesn't um, quite bridge the gap between the spend and the receipts um uh in the table on on 2.3 does it so you know there, there really is a very profound gap between the two and I'm, I'm aware that section 106 payments as you mentioned are triggered at certain development points uh you know so we may well have seen developments uh put in place um you know and, and 50 percent sold by the time the section 106 money is released to the to the county council for example for education um, but we're not even at that point able to start delivering the school that that development is going to rely on to be fully sold, are we? And, and, and the chances of delivering that school in that time frame. So there, there are real pressures and, and problems with, um, with delivering that. And I come back to the idea that you've actually got Section 106 money uh, that is, you know, at 84 million pounds, 85 million pounds um, that are required uh, for infrastructure for those uh, for those developments that is currently yet to be spent. Um, so some reassurance that when we get this uh, a similar report next year, uh, the the received revenue is going to be appreciably less than the spent revenue because we'll have gone out and built some of that infrastructure that our residents actually need. Mm -hmm. That would be what I'm looking for, really. Okay. Some reassurance. Point noted. Um, I think what might be helpful for the next iteration of it is actually to provide a bit more of a forward look as to what's actually planned and when projects are due to come forward, particularly for schools, because they are the meatier sums within the infrastructure funding statement. So that's something we can look to build on for the next iteration, if that's OK. Um, yeah. I completely take your point. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that would be uh, extremely useful. Yeah, because as I say, it's going to be a multiple year program to build that school in in um, Bishop Stortford North isn't it it's not going to be done in in 12 months to build that that entire school so uh, some some sort of timeline as to how quickly we can get some of this stuff um, delivered would be really quite useful I think no worries okay we'll look to include that next year thank you okay thank you Paul um, Rena is next uh, thank you Thank you very much, Chair. I'll just give my microphone a minute to pick up. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I, am. Uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, the report um, is the reporting period is April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021, which if I've got my timeline correct, because time has lost all meaning in some ways, that's exactly when the COVID pandemic hit and we shut down. And I just wanted to ask what impact that has and what eyes should we look at this report in light of the fact that this has probably been a very extraordinary reporting period? Yeah, I, I think it, it's quite interesting that, they, that the services have actually managed to spend and draw down significant sums even during that reporting period, if I'm honest, um, given that, you know, a lot of the building sites had to close and shut down um, during the pandemic. Um, but they seem to have managed to do an incredible job and drawn down significant sums even during those conditions. So I'd expect, you know, spend next year to be potentially even significantly higher um, if, you know, we manage to come out of uh, any further restrictions that might come forward. Um, but yeah, I, we're not aware of any particular issues um, that delayed projects aside from, you know, when sites had to be shut down, but it didn't delay the drawing down of funding um, that we're aware of. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Rena. Uh, Sandy. Thank you. Um, yes, Sarah, I, I just a bit a bit sort of slightly worried by 10.4. No sustainable Hertfordshire impact assessment was undertaken in relation to this report. And I sort of get it that this is sort of secondary rather than primary. But I just want to be reassured that stuff won't fall through the gaps of people being able to say, well, that's OK. We're not going to be policed by um, 
property and environment on on um, on on this so we can get away with doing x or y i just i just given that we have declared a climate emergency i just i'm ever so faintly unnerved by by seeing it written in that kind of faintly blunt way mm -hmm. um i i would probably comment that the services are responsible for bringing forward the individual projects um, so there's a requirement on them to align with the sustainable heart strategy when they're bringing forward projects and the action plan and agreements within those action plans that each individual services has signed up to um, as part of that work. Um, but it was felt overall that in terms of reporting on a factual assessment of uh, figures um, didn't necessarily require um, a uh, impact assessment for this report. Um, yeah. I, has that answered your question? I'm, I'm not really sure. I, have. I think I kind of get that. I just wonder whether the wording, I just, you know, it just sort of, I just felt a bit queasy reading it. And I sort of then did unpick it in the way that you have explained and thought, yeah, that's reasonable. But I just wonder whether there might be some more felicitous language. But anyway, I mean, that's all. I just wanted to flag it. You've answered. Um, I will continue, shall we say, to look at future reports through those particular spectacles because i just think it's just the biggest single thing that we need to get right okay thanks sandy i think sarah we could have just one line in, in yeah, there that says that e each individual project is looked at in that way but not when reporting with figures something like that yeah okay thank you asif next uh, thank you, Stephen. So uh, I've got uh, two points. The report that came in late, um, uh, 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 there's some errors there from Watford and Hartsmere. I think the Costco and Elton Road are actually in Hartsmere, not in Watford. It just needs to be for accuracy and for public record. I think they need to be corrected. Um, they're, they're in the wrong uh, division. But th that leads on to my second question, actually, about... Um, usage or section 106 in districts which are um, so one about processes of how they ascertained i it goes to the x and it goes to education highways etc why does it go to one project and not to another and at least on to my second question actually uh, or third is um I'm just going to be slightly parochial, but it's the concept I want to get to. So we've got the Warner Brothers Studios, which is actually in Three Rivers uh, District Council, but the highways traffic largely goes through my division, um, it, which is in Watford. And getting a crossing, uh, traffic light crossing, from Section 106 funding for Warner Brothers is nigh on impossible, although virtually all the traffic and all the buses and all the tourists go through my division. Uh, how, how do you know how do we get you know those truck you know how do we fix that type of uh, issue when it comes to funds that are available but can't be spent in a an area once the other and that actually that, that particular process as well because I can see there's lots of unspent section 106 which needs to be spent but does bureaucracy come in the way okay um on your first point, the project identification, um, that's definitely done on a service by service basis. So the um, consultations come in to the growth team and the highways team, and then they will consult internally with the various array of different services. And those services will determine for themselves which projects they think are appropriate. And then the consultation response goes back to the districts with a, this is our proposal of projects we think we need to mitigate the impact of the development. So that's typically how that process is um, uh, undertaken. Um, with regards to the Warner Brothers studio question, is that about money we already hold or is that a new yeah. section? Of right, money we yeah. already hold. So, I mean, it would very much depend on the clausing uh, clause within the Section 106 agreement, but I can certainly ask the teams to review that and get back to you outside of the meeting. Um, there's no issue with spending money from one district in another but it will very much depend on how the clause is actually worded in the agreement. I can ask the team to review that and come back to you if that's all right. That's fine. Thank you. All right. OK, thank you. Um, there are no other hands indicated, so we are asked to note the IFS and endorse the publication of the IFS 2020-2021. Would you show in chat, please? Thank you, Sarah, for that.
Fine, thank you. That is uh, done. Uh, so the last item is the GRIP Performance Monitoring Report, quarter two, July to September 2021. And Colin Haig will tell us about this. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Councillors. I think we're still good morning, aren't we? A couple of minutes to go. Um, yeah, as Stephen's just announced, this is for the July to September period of this year. The purpose of the report is really just to reassure ourselves that the planning functions we have, the growth functions, are, are operating as we expect in accordance with um, national targets. And if there are any issues, then we can start picking up on them as early as possible. Looking at the performance at a glance page, you'll see that our statutory planning functions, i.e. dealing with the planning applications that come to the County Council, we're doing well on in terms of both speed and the quality of decision making. The government targets are 60% in both cases. Uh, sorry, 60% for speed and uh, uh, no worse than 10% for quality. What I would point out is they're better devised for districts who receive hundreds, thousands of applications a year, not so applicable to counties where we get handfuls, but nevertheless a useful indicator of how we are doing. Uh, planning performance, we've got six live cases, but some of those may need to progress to court case and court action. Hence, I've given it a medium rating as there will be work involved in progressing those. We've improved our responses to planning applications received by district councils. I'm pleased to say that was a bit low last quarter. We reported we want to get that up. Um, indicator five, local plan progress. Now, clearly that's not us, that is district councils that prepare those, but we have a team that works with them and responds on behalf of all county functions. So we, we invest time and money in that process and therefore it's nice to see those progressing. There are three adopted local plans in the county at the moment, two at examination and a further five where there are old core strategies that are now progressing to local plan stage. So in terms of out of date plans, there are only two, I would say, in the county, um, but only three adopted. We'd obviously like to see that go up in coming years. Section 106 we've talked about, we've collected 3.3 .3 in that quarter, very much depends on the planning applications coming in, whether the legal agreements have been signed in any given quarter, but it shows we are doing that. And then at last meeting, I was asked to include a new indicator on staffing and vacancies. So I provided some numbers on the, the number of officers we have in the service. The vacancy rate is actually good at the moment for, for the planning system. There are, I imagine there are much higher vacancies in other districts and counties, a lot of use of agencies and consultancies. So good at the moment, although we can't be complacent, that can change quite quickly. And we do have some posts that have been vacant for a decent amount of time. We've been unable to recruit to those. But generally, I would report a good performance situation at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Colin. Uh, I think the uh, the vacancy rate in planning is very good, as you say. Um, some uh, districts and boroughs are suffering far worse than that. Um, Sandy. Um, thank you. I must say, I always find benchmarks really, very, very difficult because, you know, they can be, as you say, a bit odd and the planning ones so clearly are more relevant to our district brethren. I just had two questions about those. First of all, in terms of speed of decision making, I sort of think about our railway um, um, colleagues and, you know, what they might do sometimes in order to maximise the number of trains that run on time. Um, the ones that don't run on time are allowed to get later and later and later because that's the way to make it look as good as possible. So I guess I would like some reassurance that the two um, planning decisions where we did not meet the um, criteria are not like that left stranded at um, Carnforth or somewhere like that and a long way from getting to the terminus. And then the other question was on the quality of decision making and um, I just wanted to be certain I mean that's judged on the fact that there have been no successful appeals I mean sometimes one has to push the envelope and I just slightly worry whether that is just not again a kind of signal that we play it safe all the time even if we are uncomfortable about planning applications again that's probably more relevant to district colleagues than to ourselves but I just wouldn't mind a comment 
on that as well, because it seems to me that sometimes we bloody well should be challenging things, even if we recognise that it might be a hard, a hard ask um, to do. Now, Sandy, you, you will you will recall that there is a, an appeal going on at the moment over the quarry on the Arlington yes. site, um, which the council, this council, turned down. So we'll see how that turns out. But Colin, yes. No, good questions. In terms of the first one, there is a timescale set by government for the types of application we receive. In practice, where we get very complex minerals applications or waste applications, both the applicant and ours expect it will take more than 16 weeks. Uh, and we normally agree extensions of time and that then for counts within the government's targets. Uh, there's obviously a couple of cases where we haven't achieved that. I'm not sure what they are. I can find out if you'd like, but clearly we want to achieve that 100% if we can and definitely above the 60% and we do that by agreeing extensions. And essentially, as long as the developer is happy with that arrangement and we are providing them with a good service, then, then we are providing a good planning service, as I would see it. In terms of the quality of decision making, that is a target, less than 10%. I think you can be reassured we would never make a decision purely to hit the right number. That decision would always be based on what the right planning decision is, be it by officers under delegated or going to committee. Um, what we have to bear in mind with that one, because we have so few appeals, if we only had two a year and one of them was one and one of them was overturned, then we'd have a 50 percent rate. So we would easily fall beyond that 10 percent. Again, it works much better for a district where you're dealing with thousands of applications a year for 10 percent to be an averaged out. But yeah, hopefully that reassures you we would always make the right planning decision. And so be it. We've never had the government knocking on our door, accusing us of being a poor performing authority. To the best of my knowledge, if they did, we would make that argument that it's a very limited data set that, that, that the data relates to. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, uh, Sandy. Uh, Nigel. Uh, thank you for that. Um, what is the current situation with regards to advising local authority planning committees about uh, environmental issues such as flooding and having the capability to do that? Uh, within the county council, we have a service, it's called the LEED service that provides landscape, ecology, archaeology and various things. Some districts buy into it and some don't. So we provide that service to them. It's something we are looking at adding to this data set uh, we haven't got the information yet, but it's something we can do, but it isn't county wide. So we would have to caveat whenever we report the um, lead local flood authority role in responding to sustainable urban drainage elements. I don't report that to this committee because it sits under the environment panel. So it's not something I'm in charge of, so therefore not something I would want to report on. But clearly you'll have seen there are some staffing issues. We're hoping to get that team back up to, to good numbers to re-engage with districts on local plans and planning applications and be able to cover that. Uh, my concern is more from a point of view of when in the role of um, district councillor that um, rejecting planning applications can be very challenging at the best of times and often that evidence is crucial but I accept if it's going to the environment panel um, um, it's we have less influence over it but uh, just to make you aware of the concern about it so thank you for that anyway. No that, that's appreciated I'll talk to my colleagues about that. Yeah cheers. Thank you and Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin. Um, I got, um, I, I think, a couple of uh, hopefully relatively easy questions. The the, um, the enforcement cases, um, you, you, you said there's a, a number that are likely to proceed to um, uh, court and so on. Um, it, I, I just want, I, I suppose, a very simple reassurance that we've got uh, officers on the case with those and we're proceeding with them as fast as is uh, efficiently possible, because I am aware that these tend to be really quite substantial uh, issues. They're typically um, um, illegal waste um, processing sites. Um, and and I'm, I'm very keen that uh, 
the authority um, ensures that enforcement is done efficiently and effectively. Uh, so just some uh, reassurance that you have sufficient resource uh, for that would be uh, helpful. Yes, without getting into case details, obviously, but yeah, there are a number of cases we've taken enforcement action that hasn't been successful. So that perhaps indicates the lay of the land ahead. Uh, we are looking at financial investigation and prosecution options for some of those. That does consume resource, both officer time and financial in terms of, of barrister support. We have some of that available to start that process. I guess the issue is once you enter that labyrinth of the court system, it can be difficult from there on in as to how long it will take. So we will proceed with the right balance of preparation and caution and, and consider the, the financial implications. Always difficult because if you feel something has gone wrong and you want to tackle it, then there is a cost burden that comes with pursuing that to whatever status you may need to in, in legal terms to get the result you're after. But we can report that through future IP processes if needed. But there's no resource issue from, from your perspective in terms of, I, I understand the courts you know, the courts are a bit of a basket case at the minute and, and there's not a great deal you can do to, to um, you know, encourage and, and, and move things forward in that, that context. But there's no resource concerns that you've got about your team and the, and the finances, the, the staff resource to deliver those on those enforcement cases, is there? As we stand, I think we've got the officers and the resource to pursue and, and do some financial investigation to decide on next steps. If we had a sudden flurry of new enforcement cases, then we may need to look at whether we do. But based on the, the typical numbers, we, we're OK at the moment, I believe. Good. That, that, that's, that, that's good to hear. Um, the second question that I've got is relating to um, completed, um, you know, the, 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 one, the, the, the indicator. I can't remember which indicator it, it was now, um, but um, the um, responding to planning applications, one of the uh, number four, uh, indicator four. Um, the, the question that I was always, well, it, it's something that I don't want you to comment on, and I, I just put it out there that I've always found uh, councils marking their own homework in this context a rather a rather strange uh, anomaly of the the planning system. But in terms of the responding to the planning applications uh, criteria, how many of them were actually HCC applications? And I just wondered if you have that any sort of feel for that. Oh, I. I do you mean HCC applications that have gone into a district council that we've then commented on or? No, 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 no. I mean, um, if, for example, uh, HCC is a planning authority uh, that includes being the planning authority for its own land. So when it puts in a planning application for a school, it comes to Development Control Committee to be determined. So it is the determining authority on its own application. Now, I've always found that to be really problematic from a kind of, uh, you know, a uh, from a range of different for a range of different reasons. It is, in my view, councils marking their own homework. It's not something that we can influence. It's it's national planning policy. And I don't want to get into that. But what I wanted to know was, did you have any feel as to how many of the relatively few numbers of planning applications that we get? What proportion of them are actually our applications? As a county total, very small. The way I've tried to divide this is indicator one is the stuff we do as a statutory planning authority where planning applications come to us, including those that come from other services of the county council, like schools. Yeah. Indicator four is our responses to planning applications that go to the oh, district sorry. councils. So this is really picking up where it isn't a statutory function that we hold as a county council, but it's where we expend officer time and resource engaging in the Hertfordshire planning system. I, I, I perhaps m m miss sort of misrepresent it. I think I'm talking about uh, indicator one, actually. OK, so, um, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, then, is the best I can say at the moment. I could look okay. as to how many of those are are coming from internally versus external and, and put that in. But you can see the numbers are low anyway. 
So yeah. it would be a an even lower number of that. And it would very much depend on each quarter, I guess, as to as to yeah. what's come in rather than ever being any degree of consistency. Yeah. OK. All right. Think, yeah, I think on that, I, I sat for four years on DMC at County and we did a lot on waste sites which weren't county zones. We did um, quarries, again, not counties. And we only did a very small number of schools, actually, in, in that time. So I, I would say in the last four years, by no means the majority of uh, plan applications dealt with by county were on their own land. Most of them, that it's county matter applications that is a certain size of application. Most that we receive from our internal colleagues are smaller than that and don't get counted. They are generally dealt with under delegated powers by officers where they're extensions to schools, refurbishment, um, you know, things of that nature rather than an entire new primary or secondary school, which would go through the, the DCC process. Indeed. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Now, I've not got any more um, people wishing to speak. So uh, the recommendation here is that the panel notes the performance monitoring results uh, and the relevant previous quarters. Are you all happy to do that and put it into chat, please? Thank you. That is all noted. Um, and that's the end of the meeting. We have no other business on the agenda. So thank you for your attendance and for uh, your patience at the beginning when we had a slight technical hitch. So mm -hmm. I just on. ask something very quickly, Stephen. Yes, certainly, Sandy. Yeah. I mean, this is not for debate. It is, it is just a comment. We're the growth and infrastructure panel. And the biggest lump of infrastructure that the County Council is currently considering is the Hart um, East West Rapid Transit. Can I hope that we as a panel will have some input and get briefed on that project? It's, because it's, I think it would be disappointing if it stuck with the people that look after potholes. No, we, we will do. Um, clearly, it is transport as well, but there will be a lot of infrastructure involved in it. And uh, we will have papers on that in due course when there's something to report. I am duly reassured. Thank you. Good. Thank you. OK, so goodbye, everybody. Cheerio. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.